Welcome to Broad Eye, the podcast that explores knowledge gaps in ophthalmology and eye care. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Broad Eye Podcast. My name is Sean Maloney, and today I am speaking with one of my favorite people I've spoken with in the past in the field. This is Dr. Bill Stell, also known as Dr. Bill. Uh, Dr. Bill is a professor emeritus um, at the University of Calgary uh, Cummings School of Medicine. So, Dr. Bill, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Sean. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak with you again. Um, um, in the in the handful of conversations that we've had over time, uh, I've certainly always taken bits and pieces of wisdom away, and uh, I find that uh, you have a lot of wisdom and kindness to offer. So, um, it's going to be it's going to well, be fun. You. Thank so, you very much. In, in, in actually in talking about your wisdom and kindness, um, maybe we can kick off the conversation with uh, a story. I mean, our last conversation I mentioned um, a story of a woman who had Usher syndrome, who you were interacting with through a Facebook group, trying to offer some, uh, some advice. I was wondering if maybe you can just tell that story for the audience. Sure. Um... I'm a, a frequent visitor and identified as uh, one of the experts on the Facebook group called uh, Retinitis Pigmentosa Research and uh, Therapeutic Developments or something like that. Hey, I'm an old guy and uh, I have uh, memory problems. Uh, I, <laughs> no worries. I, I encountered through that uh, a young woman who's one of the leaders of the group who has RP, uh, not Usher actually, but who uh, suddenly, after 20 or 30 years of uh, coping with her RP, developed some balance problems. Now, she's not an aged person. She's in middle age, I guess, uh, uh, late 30s, early 40s, perhaps. Uh, I haven't asked her because that's not a polite thing to do with a woman. Um, <clears throat> and uh, her, the, the gene in which mutations cause her uh, RP is known. So I wondered, is it possible, what's that gene? And uh, could the uh, balance issues that she was developing uh, without hearing loss, could the balance issues be due some, in some way to the same mutation in her gene? So I went online, oh, bless, uh, bless Google. Uh, I uh, found that her gene is not known to be expressed in the balance, balance organ of the inner ear, the vestibular uh, organ of the inner ear, but it is expressed by cells in the vestibular nucleus of the brain, which is a group of nerve cells in the brain that receive signals from the balance organ. So that suggested at least the possibility for a future investigation in her case of whether the mutation in that gene might also be causing her balance problems because of uh, uh, a malfunction of that um, location in the brain. She was highly impressed and uh, she's become a, a good friend and we uh, chit chat now then. She joked that uh, she's lucky to have her own private um, uh, <clears throat> eye scientist. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I enjoy th doing things like that. I enjoy um, looking up something new. And, you know, I never knew that before. Uh, and it was a bit of a challenge to find that information, but uh, very satisfying to do it. Well, but you're also equipped. I mean, you have the, the background experience of, you know, know how to look and, and uh, whereas someone who hasn't done research in this space would, wouldn't even have any clue in general where to even start looking. Right. So it's a, uh, you know, I, I like that story. You're doing this just out of the, the kindness of your heart and, and helping people, which, uh, maybe we can circle back to um, a little bit later as well. Sure. But um, I was, maybe you can just give a little a snapshot of of your career. I mean, uh, and just a, as a spoiler, you're technically retired now, but I think that just this example you gave say, uh, shows that you're not fully retired from uh, from contributing to the field. But maybe if you could just give a yeah that snapshot of of your um, career journey and what that looked like, and uh, um, yeah, if you don't mind. Sure. Well, uh, actually, uh, I am fully retired because uh, the university doesn't pay me anymore. So whatever I do is uh, uh, on my own steam and my own limited resources. Uh, OK, well, I'm, I was uh, born and raised in central New York State in the US. Uh, I was educated uh, as an undergraduate in an honors program 
uh, that emphasize self-guided learning and an independent inquiry and criti critical thinking at Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania. I went from there to medical school at the University of Chicago, but I became disillusioned very quickly with the, the lack of questioning and uh, critical thinking in medicine. It's all about learning how to do it and applying uh, a certain body of knowledge to fix the problem. I have no problem with that. Uh, I, I would be reluctant to go to a doctor who spends his time wondering, well, hmm, wonder what I should do about this. <laughs> no. When I yeah, go to fair. the doctor, I want to fix. But it wasn't the most uh, interesting thing for me. And I was fortunate to be plucked from a histology class in first year medicine by one of the professors of anatomy who said, um, Mr. Stell, now I think you can do this work on your own. So if you like, you can do histology lab on your own time and come and work in my lab. I have an electron microscope. Well, I had spent a summer as a summer student learning to use an electron microscope, and uh, that was all I needed. So uh, off I went, and after the first year of med school, uh, I was thinking of simply dropping out, but I was persuaded to uh, take leave, which I did. So I spent two years in uh, the graduate program in the Department of, of Anatomy with Professor Bill Doyle. Who, whose kindness to let me uh, design and carry out my very own PhD project uh, <clears throat> was uh, the greatest gift I could have gotten at the years and at the time. Uh, and then I got uh, a fellowship from the Life Insurance Medical Research Fund to uh, finish uh, my MD as well and get a PhD in MD, which I did. Uh, I graduated in 1967 with both degrees and um, was fortunate again to have people looking out for me. Uh, at my age then of uh, 28, I, uh, with an MD, I was ripe for draft uh, to go into the uh, US Armed Services as, uh, as a doctor and to serve on the front lines in Vietnam or in an induction hospital. And, and none of those was very appealing to me. Um, so I, I was able through the help of good people to get a, a postdoctoral position at the National, Institute, the National Institutes of Health, where I spent uh, five years working in a lab and uh, honing my research skills. Uh, and then in the early 70s, I went to the Jules Stein Eye Institute at UCLA, uh, spent eight years there, and I moved to Calgary in 1980 with my young family uh, taking the position of head of the Lions Site Center, which was a, a newly formed research group uh, at the University of Calgary. And uh, <clears throat> that got me involved with the Lions and uh, raising funds for uh, site research. Uh, it also involved me in working with uh, other researchers who were doing uh, eye research. And uh, over the years, I had lots of students at all levels from undergrad to uh, graduate research to medical school uh, to postdocs and I'm still in touch with many of them. Uh, my, my training uh, starting from my self-designed PhD uh, project at the University of Chicago was in uh, basic retinal neurobiology uh, studying retinal neural circuitry and visual processing, how, how it lets us uh, see colors and contrasts and so on. Uh, but in the early 1990s, I uh, heard a lecture on myopia by a, a wonderful professor, uh, the late Josh Wallman, whose uh, evidence uh, showed clearly that uh, myopia, uh, which is near or short-sightedness, short <clears throat> is um, a, a problem that is affected uh, hugely by activity of the retina. And I realized that uh, uh, while most people in the field were uh, approaching it from background in optics and lenses and uh, correcting refraction, that uh, there was a, a pretty open field for someone like me with background in retinal circuitry 
uh, to approach the underlying uh, causes and not just uh, uh, with, with long-term implications for care, but not going directly to uh, fixes without really knowing what's uh, going on that causes the problem in the first place. So I, uh, I did that for uh, almost 20 years. And uh, then I retired from uh, the University of Calgary faculty and closed my research operations at the end of June, 2020. Now, 2020 was an auspicious year for a student of myopia and refraction, you know. Uh, <laughs> fair, enough, fair enough. Unfortunately, uh, a, uh, a symposium to celebrate the university's getting rid of me, uh, a symposium <laughs> that we were calling uh, 2020 Vision, of course, uh, that uh, never took place because of the pandemic. But in spite of that, uh, yes, as you pointed out, Sean, I still am continuing uh, to be involved in mentoring. A significant number of my past students stay in touch with me. Uh, I often am called upon them to, uh, upon by them to uh, provide references for uh, academic positions, for uh, uh, graduate or, or medical programs and so forth. Um, and I even have picked up a couple of new undergraduates to mentor in the past uh, couple of years. Uh, so I'm these, working with these young people and helping them find their way, not my way, uh, is uh, something that is really uh, incredibly fascinating to me. And finally, I, I also am employed part-time as an expert research advisor to myopia research groups in Asia. Uh, in mainland China, one of them, in Wenzhou, China, and in uh, Singapore with the Singapore Eye Research Institute. Uh, and I still am called on occasionally to uh, <clears throat> referee uh, uh, research papers submitted for publication in scientific journals and uh, to review grant proposals for granting agencies. So, yeah, I keep busy enough, and uh, this is all good. It keeps my brain alive. And uh, on the side, I spent some time with my, uh, my wife and uh, uh, her daughter and her family who live in town, my daughter who lives in town, uh, my other daughter and her family who uh, live in Japan. And um, thank goodness for the internet and uh, uh, means of virtual communication. Fair enough. The, uh, no, that's a that's a great uh, that's a great story. I feel like we can uh, we could probably write a short book about your life, and I think I already have the title. It would be something along the lines like "You Had Me at Electron Microscope," but <laughs> mm -hmm. it uh, it uh, no no it's it's great. The uh, obviously your your experience is um, you know has covered the whole uh, realm of of uh, eye disease, and you mentioned uh, myopia um, as a as a major focus. And, you know, we can certainly talk about that, but I think today we'd be dive more into uh, retinitis pigmentosa. Um, obviously, it's a disease that I am personally familiar with. Um, and, uh, and certainly you, uh, with your research background, know quite a bit in this space. Um, but I guess my first question is, why the interest in retinitis pigmentosa? Why... Uh, when you, you have such a strong background in, in myopia and continue to do some work, as you mentioned, in Asia, um, in, in that space, why, why such an interest in, in RP? Well, uh, first of all, as I mentioned before, uh, for my whole scientific life, my whole professional life, I've been interested in fundamentals of retinal neurobiology, uh, retinal cell circuitry, and uh, how normal vision takes place. But I found myself coming to Calgary in a group of uh, uh, young people, young faculty in uh, the anatomy department who had, um, who were interested in retinal degeneration and were doing uh, research on an animal model of retinal degeneration called the RCS rat, uh, which at the time um, was uh, a well-known spontaneously occurring uh, strain of animals, but uh, the basis of their disease was still not known. So that was a, a lively bit of study. And my colleagues, uh, Art Spira and Pat Wise and uh, uh, Rick Hanna 
and uh, several others in the department were all interested in this stuff. And the Lions had just raised a, a considerable chunk of cash to set up uh, new labs, including the one that I was able to move in when I arrived. So uh, there was an, a sort of retinal degeneration focus around me. And uh, this led to my uh, becoming scientific advisor to the uh, RP Foundation of Canada in 1989. And I spent half a dozen years at that. And then I returned uh, later as uh, uh, the scientific advisor again in the, uh, oh, from about 2007 to 2014. So th through those activities, I, uh, I got to read lots of research grants proposing to do something art, uh, about RP and other renal degenerative diseases and uh, to meet uh, vision scientists who were concerned with this all across Canada. And uh, because I, I, this kind of research was a, a very small select group in Canada in the 1980s. So to get a good peer review of research grant proposals that were submitted, I had to go outside Canada. So I also got to know a lot of the people, especially in the US, uh, whom I could contact, pick up the phone, have a chat with them about uh, uh, this grant proposal that had been submitted. So through the RP Foundation of Canada and its good people, uh, I made lots of connections with RP, learned a lot about what it was, which wasn't much uh, a mere 25 years ago, uh, and uh, also got involved in uh, fundraising. So. Uh, there were fundraisers that uh, began and have, have become uh, a, a frequent part of the foundation's activities. Uh, and also the uh, motorcyclists ride for sight in Alberta, uh, which introduced me to a wonderful, wonderful bunch of men and women who uh, rode, as their slogan said, uh, they rode for sight because, because we can, was the slogan. Uh, you need sight to ride a motorcycle. And so they rode for the benefit of those who didn't have the sufficient sight to ride a motorcycle. It was very inspiring. And uh, also, as I mentioned, uh, I have uh, had my finger on the pulse of current develop developments through uh, the Facebook group on uh, research and therapy developments. And um, Finally, in the last uh, 10 years and more, I've uh, collaborated with uh, Torben Beck Hansen, uh, who has uh, a who developed a totally uh, unique mouse model of inherited retinal disease. And uh, through that also got to uh, work with and uh, get to know very well personally, uh, Yves Sauvé, at uh, the University of Alberta, whom you have recently interviewed. Yeah, no, for sure. No, I, I th thanks for giving that that background. Now you mentioned that um, obviously in this journey into retinal degeneration and RP, um, you know, you've kept your finger on the pulse of of what's happening in that space as far as latest research, uh, clinical trials, therapeutic avenues, etc. I was wondering if maybe you can provide a little. Uh, you know, just a, a little nugget of, of info around the various um, treatment approaches for RP, uh, you know, what's happening out there and, um, and maybe, you know, when during the, I guess, stage of progression, um, each might be applicable. For example, maybe one is more applicable toward end stage and not early stage and vice versa. Sure. No, I'd be happy to do that. Well, the, the, uh, the first therapy that was um, proposed for any form of RP uh, was proposed by, uh, uh, I'm locked on his name, uh, at Harvard, uh, who uh, discovered that vitamin A and some other uh, flavonoid vitamins uh, could be helpful for some forms of mostly autosomal dominant, dominant RP. Uh, and probably as a, a kind of neuroprotective uh, therapy, which would uh, keep 
whatever cells you've still got after the uh, uh, retinal degeneration has shown up and affected your vision could keep the cells that are left from dying. And uh, so that means that uh, some of the uh, rods that were still not uh, uh, sent to rod heaven by the uh, deadly mutation uh, and also the cones, which uh, eventually die as a result of rod death, uh, could be spared. So that at the very least, uh, while this therapy wouldn't restore vision, it would uh, slow down or even prevent uh, the continued loss of vision in someone who had the disease, this, this kind of disease. Now, unfortunately, there, there are some forms of the most common uh, uh, mutation in the rod visual pigment, uh, rhodopsin, uh, the gene for that. Uh, there are some forms of that uh, protein that uh, make, in, in which uh, the disease is made even worse by taking vitamin A. So that lets me slip in a, a, a pitch in favor of getting genetically tested and identifying uh, exactly what the gene mutation is, uh, no matter uh, who you are, or what your kind of disease is, uh, if you can possibly do it. Uh, unfortunately, the, the vast majority of people in the world are nowhere near a doctor who can even properly examine their eyes, much less uh, <clears throat> obtain a, a, a sample for gene testing and much less pay for it, even if they could do all that. But, okay, so uh, diet was uh, introduced and it's still uh, a popular item um, and because uh, uh, so limited, such limited options are available for anyone who has RP. Um, and also because uh, a whole lot of companies have uh, taken up the cause and, uh, and just bombard the uh, RP information sites and uh, 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 the uh, web uh, social media with uh, their advertisements for this wonderfully effective uh, dietary supplements. Well, uh, it may be helpful for some, but it's, it's far from a cure-all. Uh, the next cure that came along was uh, what came to be called generally as gene therapy. And what that really meant was supplementing uh, good genes in cases where uh, 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 the mutation of a gene necessary for vision uh, had caused, uh, caused loss of function. So in those cases, and, and nothing else, just like uh, if your car runs out of gas, okay, what do you do? You give it more gas. And uh, in case you have a, a loss of function mutation, uh, the kind of mutation that's uh, recessively inherited, uh, <clears throat> you ought to be able to uh, treat it by putting gas in the tank, which amounts to uh, using, a, uh, using some tricks viral vectors or uh, nanoparticles uh, to carry a gene replacement into the retina and, and get those genes into the affected retinal cells, usually the rod and cone photoreceptors, and restore their function. So uh, that was, that's been done quite successfully, although in a very limited way, with uh, uh, certain forms of uh, uh, labor congenital amaurosis, L LCA, uh, and in particular to insert good copies of the RPE65 gene, which uh, is needed in the retinal pigment epithelium to restore visual pigment. Okay. Um, oh, and uh, that reminds me of something I hadn't thought about for a while. Another sort of dietary treatment is to give in the diet uh, a replacement for uh, the form of vitamin A that uh, captures light in our visual pigments and starts the phototransduction cascade. And uh, <clears throat> that was uh, championed by uh, a Canadian group. Uh, unfortunately, it seems to have gotten lost in the shuffle uh, and uh, maybe it just didn't uh, work out in further testing. I've lost track of that. Uh, Which group okay. was that? Which group was that? It was, uh, I think, Rob Konekoop. Okay, uh, okay, yeah. But, yeah I know uh, but, but maybe, maybe um, 
gee, I don't know. Somehow, somehow it got um, uh, uh, handed off to a small company in the Vancouver area, I think. And uh, I don't know who was involved in that. So I think, I think uh, Rob was uh, probably the one who did that. And it had a name which I should remember, but don't. Oh, no, that's, that, that's fine. Sorry, sorry. I'll let you keep going. <laughs> yeah. So uh, <clears throat> the, the remaining therapies that I'm going to talk about are aimed at replacing the lost uh, uh, cells. So in most forms of, of RP, uh, the rods, the rod photoreceptors, which are responsible for uh, detect detecting very weak light, uh, they uh, degenerate at first or lose function at least first. And then eventually, because of their uh, loss of function or their dying off, uh, the cones also become uh, uh, affected. And uh, this is what causes, first of all, the uh, <clears throat> difficulty with uh, uh, vision in dim light, uh, so night blindness. And then the, the gradual encroachment of that peripheral visual loss on the central retinal region where it's mostly cones and eventually they're lost as well. And uh, uh, that's when the RP patient is left with just a, a little spot of tunnel vision in, in the center. All right, so uh, uh, three basic uh, approaches to um, replacement of lost function. Uh, the one that has been lurking around for the longest time uh, has been uh, transplanting uh, healthy retinal cells, healthy rods. Let's just uh, talk about rods for convenience. And uh, that ranged from harvesting rods as a, a sheet of cells from cadavers and transplanting that into uh, the RP affected eye. And uh, that effort is still a little bit alive, but I think the, the people who, who did that, uh, and I'm blocking on their names as well, uh, but they're at uh, the University of California in uh, LA region, but not in Los Angeles proper. Um, <clears throat> but um, a, a better way, and really I think uh, the one of, one of the two uh, therapies that I would uh, stake my money and almost my life on is transplantation of <clears throat> stem cell derived uh, rods. And huge advances have been made in the past uh, just five or 10 years in the ability to, uh, <clears throat> to make cells that when transplanted into the, uh, into the eye, uh, behind the retina uh, have at least the potential to uh, become rods and to become uh, incorporated into retinal circuitry so that they could replace the lost sensing of light and also the lost signaling of uh, light absorption uh, to the rest of the retina and from there to the brain. Uh, there have been fits and starts in this and uh, 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 several groups have reported transplant, uh, successful transplantation in uh, animal models only to discover that uh, the marker that was uh, <clears throat> genetically created in the donor cells, uh, a fluorescent protein, was itself uh, passed from the uh, implanted cells to the remaining uh, um, uh, endogenous uh, host retinal cells. Uh, and that uh, seeing marked cells didn't mean that the injected cells had been uh, incorporated and were functioning. But I, a couple of recent reports have, uh, have reported in very well controlled uh, experiments, success in getting uh, delivery of <clears throat> uh, stem cell derived cell, uh, retinal precursor cells uh, into the subretinal space and uh, creating new rods and getting them to incorporate into the retina and to signal light reception. So I think there's some real promise for that. Uh, and just as a, as a, a, a side comment, 
because for the first, well, for, for all of my uh, scientific life, I have done research not on human beings, uh, and except for a, a few cases working with someone else, uh, not even uh, work with uh, non-human primates, but with, uh, with fish and chickens. And uh, in fish, there's this remarkable thing that uh, in the goldfish, for example, which was my uh, PhD thesis uh, research animal, <clears throat> new rods are created throughout the whole life of the animal. And those new rods are incorporated into retinal circuitry um, just like that. It's uh, the natural thing for them to do. And uh, it astounds me that uh, no one has yet really focused or at least focused successfully on identifying what, uh, what unique factors allow uh, rod precursors to do that in a fish, but uh, implanted rods uh, mostly not to do that uh, in a primate or in a human being. Okay, so I, I, my, my first bet, if I were a millionaire, would be a replacement of the missing photoreceptors, rods and or cones by new ones created by uh, stem cells. And we don't need to use embryonic stem cells anymore because uh, five or 10 years ago, a group, I think it was in Japan, uh, discovered how to uh, treat uh, stem cells for uh, more specific for bodily tissues, like the stem cells that create new skin all the time. So you could start with those stem cells and uh, give them a few more genetic instructions that would make them move towards becoming rods or cones. So uh, that's wonderful because it means that there's, there's a virtually inexhaustible supply of the stem cells and uh, they can be stem cells from uh, the patient to be treated uh, from his or her own body uh, giving the advantage of no immune response, no immune rejection, but on the other hand, giving, uh, having still the mutation, although uh, uh, <clears throat> in principle, the existing mutation could be treated in the stem cells and then healthy cells bearing all the, uh, all the uh, marks of uh, um, the patient's own body so that they're accepted. Uh, could be injected, there would be healthy replacements for the uh, unhealthy uh, <clears throat> uh, degenerated cells. So that's, that's my number one candidate. My number two candidate is optogenetics. Uh, optogenetics is a catch-all term for using uh, genetics, actually using a, a sort of gene therapy to make cells responsive to light cells that weren't uh, previously responsive to light. So uh, even if all the rods and cones had been lost, you could in principle make other cells in the retina that are still there and living for a long time after the rods and cones are gone, you could make them into light re receptors. And uh, uh, so this was done using uh, uh, the genes, the very simple genes for light responsive uh, pigments from uh, marine algae for uh, single-celled plants uh, that grow in abundance in the ocean. And uh, they detect light and it's uh, a, a part of the regulation of their activity and metabolism as well as uh, a source of energy uh, for them to live. <clears throat> so this has done, been done successfully uh, to make the retinal ganglion cells uh, um, light receptive and to signal uh, vision-like uh, signals to the brain uh, and also uh, to make bipolar cells uh, <clears throat> directly light sensitive and they then signal to the uh, ganglion cells which signal to the brain. Now the bipolar cells are the relays between uh, rod and cone photoreceptors and retinal ganglion cells so uh, the signals that they put out are much like the signals that come from the rods and cones themselves, just uh, minimally processed 
to increase sensitivity and to give some discrimination of uh, spatial sense. Um, <clears throat> Now, the, the, the drawback of the original experiments using this particular optogenetic approach uh, is that the uh, uh, light sensors, light sensitive proteins from algae uh, are, uh, which are, are called, back, oh, and bacterial. Uh, so um, anyway, these light sensitive molecules uh, are not very sensitive. They require a lot more light than rods and even cones require to generate a response. And they only respond over uh, about a hundredfold range of light intensities, which is uh, a, a serious limitation. So uh, for using these light sensors as therapy, uh, the patient has to not only get a successful uh, uh, infusion of light sensitive, uh, of genes for light sensitive proteins into their uh, retinal bipolar cells or ganglion cells, but also has to wear a special goggle uh, and use a, a, a video image of the visual scene, feed it to a computer, which boosts the signal and then gives an amplified light signal uh, to the retina so that uh, things can actually be seen by the insensitive uh, pigments that have been uh, implanted. But one group in Europe has now succeeded in putting uh, a, a modified form of lapsin, which is the <coughs> protein that uh, couples to a vitamin A uh, form and makes rhodopsin and conopsins, the our natural light sensors. And uh, these have the potential of being much more sensitive and uh, <clears throat> possibly uh, modified uh, to encode for different uh, parts of the spectrum for different colors as well. Uh, and so I think that's uh, my other uh, top choice if I were a billionaire to uh, support new therapeutic developments. And finally, the, the uh, remaining set of things that uh, I've, I've kind of passed by in a hurry because I'm not really enthusiastic about them, but they are around and they are actually available for treatment is electronic prostheses or chips. So uh, a little chip, just uh, one or two millimeters across the thickness of a dime. Um, it, it can be uh, implanted into the eye uh, on the front surface of the retina, that's called an epiretinal prosthesis, or underneath the retina between the photoreceptors and the pigment epithelium, and that's called a subretinal prosthesis, or a group in uh, Australia has been pioneering the development of a uh, suprachoroidal uh, prosthesis, which goes uh, which, which requires implantation farther outside the, farther from the interior of the eye, so that it's less likely to cause uh, serious complications and much, e uh, much easier to uh, remove uh, if something goes wrong and it has to be removed. Um, the problem with these things is A, they're small, so they, uh, just to, just to, give any vision at all, you know, a couple of millimeters is a tiny spot, a few degrees of uh, the central vision that you've got left uh, after um, uh, having long-term RP. Uh, and uh, beyond that, that they also uh, require external video camera and computer uh, to provide stimulation that corresponds to the visual scene. Uh, and finally, that uh, their spatial resolution, visual acuity with these is not very good. So, uh, but one of them, and, uh, and I'm blocking that name too, but- uh, The Argus the, 2, I think you're thinking Argus of. The Argus 2, thank the you. The Argus yes. 2, there you go. The no Argus worries. 2, good. which is an epiretinal uh, implant, uh, has been approved for use in many European countries and in the USA and in Canada in studies that were supported by the Foundation Fighting Blindness of Canada. So there we are. I've, uh, oh, oh, and there are also 
ways of bypassing the eye altogether. So uh, stimulating the visual cortex with either an array of electrodes, or I, I just saw a paper yesterday from uh, the group uh, by uh, Jose Alain Sahel uh, using focused ultrasound to stimulate cortical cells, visual cortex in the brain. Um, <clears throat> and the, the, the cool thing about the ultrasound, if it proves to be useful, is that it doesn't, it's totally non-invasive. Uh, there would be just a, an ultrasound uh, transponder uh, on the skull, on the scalp that uh, beams in to the, uh, the visual cortex. So that's, lots and lots of you know, wild, <laughs> wild things are going on. And Th that, uh, what group was that you said that uh, uh, I missed uh, that? The, the group of uh, Sahel, S-A-H-E-L. Oh, uh, Dr. Sahel. So we had, we've had him on the podcast before. Um, he's based in, in France, right? Um, yeah, he, he, but yeah. he, now, he now has an appointment at uh, the University of Pittsburgh. <laughs> And I think okay. Uh, okay. that might be where he's working out of for the most part. Okay. Um, I, can, uh, I can dig up that paper and send it to you if you like. Yeah, that, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah, I'll to... email it to you. Yeah. Great. Um, but anyway, there, there we are. That's what I know about uh, therapies. They cover a wide range. And um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I think, uh, I think... your, your next, qu next question was... Uh, <laughs> What's the what's going to be the most important and impactful of those? And I think I've I think I've added it. Uh, either it's restoring the natural about. retina by uh, yeah. getting transplants to work, or uh, creating new receptors by optogenetic therapy. And I think those are all those, those are again the ones that I would put my money on. Yeah. No. Fair. Uh, no. And listen. Thanks for that. You gave a very very comprehensive overview. Um, it's nice to be able to tie all these things together in a single discussion because um, oftentimes I might talk with somebody about a specific therapeutic avenue, uh, but you've right. given a nice, a nice uh, um, overview for, for someone listening. Um, I, might, I have just one more question before we, we wrap up. Um, I've taken a lot of your time already, but I wanted to circle back to what we were discussing at the beginning, which was um, about you know how you're working helping this Facebook group, you're not being compensated financially for this. Um, what are you know maybe talking about this, but any other activities um, that uh, people who are officially retired but obviously still wanting to um, help people in the space, uh, whether it's patients or uh, companies or research groups or whatnot, what opportunities do you see for people who have this expertise? Um, who might want to keep a foot in that area um, that are officially retired. Right. Well, uh, the obvious thing is that we can't really work directly with individuals except through uh, social media. So I can't sit down and talk with a patient. Uh, I, maybe I could in principle. I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, so the way things are now, we can uh, join up a Facebook group, or uh, there must be other social media that have uh, similar groups, um, and, uh, and have dialogue with uh, both researchers and uh, patients, uh, and become part of the general discussion and provide our knowledge and uh, expertise and insight uh, about uh, uh, proposed therapies and uh, help people who are not scientists to uh, understand whether the claims made by, oh, people are offering, offering a dietary supplement, uh, whether those claims are valid or not. Um, and uh, there ought to be more of that. There ought to be more of more exposure of scientists who are good communicators, like Yves Sauvet, who is fantastic more exposure to the general public, uh, not just people who have RP, but um, uh, people in general, to understand what science is, how uh, science is uh, used as a method to develop a uh, better understanding of disease and better therapy for disease, uh, and to help evaluate, just as we're confronting in the current pandemic, for goodness sake, to evaluate claims that are made uh, and to help guide uh, non-scientists to make uh, responsible and sensible uh, evidence-based decisions. 
uh, unfortunately, most, most of us in science are, are so busy doing our science uh, and uh, uh, coping with the high levels of competition to get uh, research support from uh, uh, granting agencies that can only fund, well, maybe 10% of all of the applications that are submitted to them. Uh, that would be true of the uh, uh, CIHR in Canada and the NIH in the US and most, most granting agencies in most places. Uh, probably uh, half, uh, at least half of the submitted applications are worthy of support, but there's not enough money there. So government agencies and private uh, charities and the good people who support them uh, need to step up more and promote more and better science and bring the results and then the process of science to the attention of the general public. Uh, there's also the approach of, of mentoring young researchers, students and uh, uh, future researchers and clinician scientists. Uh, to prepare them to do the kind of work that needs to be done in the future. And uh, that's one of my main motivations for continuing uh, the work that I do with uh, research groups and, um, and with uh, former students and current students, uh, although I'm retired. And then we can advise research groups, uh, as I'm doing with the uh, two groups in Asia. We can advise uh, granting agencies and scientific journals by uh, providing expert review for them. Um, and uh, we can certainly steer uh, the young researchers and future scientists in interesting directions and help them to produce good science, which in turn produces good therapies. Uh, fair. No, it makes, and it makes a lot of sense. I think there's just a, a wealth of knowledge out there, um, I'll call it among retirees or, or people nearing the end of their careers, that uh, is largely untapped. And I mean, you've you know blazed your own path and found ways to to contribute. I'm sure there are um, you know many scientists or clinicians um, you know at that phase of their careers or life uh, where they wouldn't mind you know helping out uh, you know five ten hours a week doing something. They don't want to want a full time job, but um, certainly have um, the expertise to, to, and not necessarily looking to get compensated just to, to, you know, keep a, a foot in the field and, and to help out uh, just because it's the right thing to do. So I commend you for, for what you're doing. I think it's, I think it's amazing to, uh, uh, you can imagine, I can imagine from, you know, a patient's perspective going to these online groups and all of a sudden you have, you know, somebody with your experience there helping to answer questions. <laughs> it's kind of like a, you kind of feel like, whoa, I hit the jackpot here. Like you, you mentioned before about that woman. Uh, you feel she's got her own little private uh, eye scientist. So, um, no, this, this is great. Um, Dr. Bill, well, you, any, know, any... you know, you know, Sean, I, I, yeah. introduced, I introduced myself as uh, Dr. Bill, the Dr. Bill you don't have to pay. There you go. There you go. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> Since I retired, it's more true than ever. Fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. Um, any, any parting words of wisdom or, or suggestions for anybody listening to this podcast, whether that be, call it, uh, you know, retired clinicians and researchers or patients, uh, anywhere in between, anything else that you'd like to share with them uh, before we wrap up? Yeah, just very quickly, I think for patients, don't hesitate to uh, push your eye doctors uh, to share with you how much they know uh, don't accept that their knowledge is limited and let it stop there, but uh, uh, step up to the next higher level. And uh, uh, here in Canada and in the US, we have wonderful foundations, uh, Fighting Blindness Canada here and the Foundation Fighting Blind Bl Blindness in the US and similar organizations nationally in many countries uh, that uh, either have experts on staff or can network you with uh, experts uh, anywhere in the world to get more information. So I think uh, patients' insistence on better knowledge and uh, uh, better advice is one of the keys. And the other key, I, I guess, is for uh, clinicians who are providing diagnoses and, uh, 
and hopefully in the near future cures uh, need to be pushed to be more aware uh, that cures are in the pipeline. Uh, I've, I've seen and heard patients say over and over, oh, they've gone to their uh, retina specialist and uh, he or she says, oh, you have RP and I'm sorry, there's nothing that we can do for it. And that's the end of it. And they, they leave discouraged and uh, withdrawn and it shouldn't be that way at all. So however, however it is through the activities of individual patients, through patient advocacy groups and foundations, through clinicians, through scientists, through government agencies, uh, all uh, uh, need to work harder to bring awareness of the problem and awareness of the hope. And there is hope. Excellent. No, I think those are uh, excellent pieces of advice. So Dr. Bill, Dr. Bill Stell, thanks so much for, for taking the time to do this. Um, you know, you're, you're truly an inspiration. I hope that at you know, uh, my, when I retire that I emulate what you're doing and, you know, just giving back and helping others and, and staying, staying connected. So thanks for taking well, the time uh, to uh, do this. It's my pleasure. And Mr. Sean, you are doing the same yourself already. <laughs> and I, I admire you for that. And thank you again for having me here. All right. Thank you. Okay. Bye for now. And that concludes today's episode of the Broad Eye Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Of course, ratings and reviews are always welcome. And you can certainly share this episode with any of your colleagues or friends who might enjoy it. Thanks for listening.